and it's my pleasure to introduce Johannes Koffler, who is going to talk about deep learning for quantum physics and astronomy. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. It's a great pleasure for me to tell you a little bit about um, the research uh, I've done in the last couple of years uh, at the Institute of Machine Learning in Linz. Um, now I'm uh, after parental leave year back at Quantum Information in the Institute for Integrated Circuits. So the task of today in the first 10 minutes or so will be to give you an overview of some fundamental um, neural network architectures. Uh, you all, of course, uh, know feed-forward neural networks and probably most of you know convolutional neural nets. Uh, residual neural networks are maybe not so well known uh, outside the field of machine learning. And then I will talk a little bit of recurrent neural nets, in particular the long short term memory, and then uh, two slides on graph neural networks. And it's actually the residual networks, the long short term memory, and the graph neural networks, which I will then later use in showing you three uh, applications. Um, the first is modeling multi-particle high dimensional quantum experiments, second is predicting outcomes of pairwise planetary collisions, and the third is to learn the ground state properties of uh, quantum Hamiltonians. Okay, so without much further ado, uh, you all uh, probably are aware of this picture in one way or another. So about 10 years ago, the deep learning revolution has started because we had fast enough computers and large enough data sets. Actually, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning, which dates back to the 80s. And machine learning is one pillar and one subfield of the big field of artificial intelligence, which dates back to... Uh, the perceptron and, and ELISA back in the 50s. Yeah, feed-forward neural networks are, so to say, the vanilla standard uh, setup. You have an input layer, then some hidden layers, and an output. And it is known since uh, Kurt Hornick's work in the beginning of 1990s that uh, feed-forward neural nets are universal function approximators. So even one hidden layer that is arbitrarily wide uh, is enough that uh, such a feed-forward neural network or a multi-layer perceptron, one hidden layer already makes it a multi-layer, uh, is enough to uh, approximate any function you wish in principle. This is just an existence uh, proof. It, uh, of course, is an art and, and, and not easy at all to do the learning algorithm and to have this universal approximator in the end for your data. Um, the learning of a neural network usually works via backpropagation. This is an algorithm dating back to the 80s. Uh, Geoffrey Hinton, I think, and others invented it. So the weights are updated via gradient descent with an error signal. And very early, and this led to uh, somewhat dying out of deep learning in the 1990s, is the so-called vanishing gradient problem. If you have a deep neural net and you have an error in the output layer, how does the error signal propagate back to the input layer? It usually gets weak weaker and weaker, and you have to fight against this vanishing gradient problem. And there are many solutions, uh, many of them developed only in the last 10 years or so. Uh, there's batch normalization, uh, good choices of activation functions, but also LSTMs, well, they are back in the 90s, and residual nets. Um, convolutional neural nets are your networks of choice if you deal with picture data. So uh, even a low uh, resolution picture with 250 by 250 pixels with three, three color channel is an extremely high input dimension, almost 200,000 input uh, um, uh, nodes. So, but the good thing about pictures is that pixels that are close to each other are correlated and some basic patches like edges and corners appear again and again. It doesn't matter whether you train on cats and dogs and horses or on houses and airplanes. Even in our brain, the very first things that happen in our brain after the visual signal uh, is processed is to get uh, corners and contrast changes. And these would be the low level kernels that you train. And the miracle or the magic of convolutional neural nets is that you apply small weight matrices, or also called kernels, also called filters, and they are usually just three by three, at most five by five uh, pixels, and you slide them over the whole picture to get the next um, feature map of the next layer. So you reuse only a very small number of weights. In this picture, it's only nine weights. You reuse them again and again. This is in very stark contrast to a fully connected network where every pixel 
uh, from the source image would be connected to, so to say, every pixel of the first feature map, and that would be a quadratic number of pixels. So this weight sharing is the magic of CNNs, and since about 2012 or so, uh, all vision um, challenges are won by convolutional nets. So this has completely changed the decade-old game of, of, of vision tasks, and everything today, facial recognition, segmentation, and so on, is done by convolutional nets. Another architecture that is uh, very powerful are so-called re residual networks or res nets. And the trick here is that you have so-called skip connections or highway connections or shortcuts. And they jump over one or multiple layers. So you not only now have layer connections from layer to layer, but you have these highway connections that jump over multiple other layers and make, so to say, a fast uh, possible error signal uh, to, to, to the lower layer. And in the initial training phase, uh, there's a fast adjustment just of these few layers that have the skip connections, and only later there's an adjustment of the um, skipped layers. And this leads to much uh, stabler gradients uh, in learning, and also then to faster and better learning. And these residual networks um, have allowed and opened up the path to have deep learning architectures of thousand or more layers, which is, which is really impressive. And especially this combination of residual nets and convolutional nets is uh, extremely powerful. Um, then uh, another very important architecture are so-called recurrent neural nets, RNNs. So uh, on the top right here, we have the picture of a feedforward net. We have uh, x1, x2 as input. Then we have a hidden layer here with activations a1, a2, a3, and an output. <clears throat> and in a recurrent neural net, in every time step, you would allow a feedback from every node of the hidden layer to itself and every other node in the hidden layer. So the nodes are connected now to each other in the hidden layers. And this allows for some kind of internal state or a kind of memory. And also you can now process arbitrary or not predefined length of input. So I can input one uh, input vector, in that case only x1, x2, so two um, words, for instance. And uh, in the next time step, I input another x1, x2 entry and another one. And with every tick, the recurrent net sees the new input, but also remembers the past inputs with this internal connection in its hidden layer. And this is um, the most uh, promising architecture in general for sequence classification, sequence generation, um, and, and meta learning, and so on. In print, this was uh, or is still a standard architecture for translation. You would enter word by word here in red, for instance then the recurrent neural net would so say tick, 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 and then it would output the words in the other language. Or it would many to one. You input some words and would, it would output you only which type of language, English, Italian, French. So there are many different ways how you can use these networks, and they are usually trained via backpropagation in time. So very similar to the standard backpropagation algorithm, you just have to be a bit more careful to really tick it back in time until the first input. And one particular um, variation of the recurrent neural network is the so-called long short-term memory, LSTM, which was um, invented beginning of the 90s. And it is a very powerful architecture because it can store information indefinitely via an integrator, but it can be selective about what to store via gating. And this is actually the, 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 one of the holy grails of RNNs that, that uh, you have this selectivity, and the integrator is uh, just uh, uh, a cell state being added up to its own past, so it stores information over time by just adding up, and there are no vanishing gradients. You have this stability here in the LSTM learning because of this integrator property. And then you have gates, an input gate, an output gate, also a forget gate, and they serve as an attention mechanism. Uh, um, there is a feedback because of the recurrent hidden state, and the output gate can influence the values for the next hidden states. And all these gates, the input gate, the output gate, and also the forget gate, they are full neural networks themselves that you have to learn. So the LSTM, in some sense, is a recurrent neural net where other networks learn what to look at, what to forget, what to memorize, and how to weigh the importance um, in the future. And 
uh, until the transformers came up uh, a couple of years ago, LSTMs were the state of the art in speech text generation and recognition, time series prediction, so all your uh, voice control in the mobile phones, uh, the translation that happened between in all the 2010 to 20, so to say, this was all based, your Alexa, Siri, whatever you had, this was all based on the LSTM architecture. Um, now I want to say a couple of words on graph neural networks. They are particularly interesting, I think, uh, from, for physicists maybe, because they have a very good inductive bias and are very well suited if your process data can be represented on or as graphs. Um, so for instance, you could want to learn the toxicity uh, of molecules, and then your molecule would have an adjacency matrix. You could put it mathematically in a graph with, with um, uh, the adjacency matrix telling who is correlated to whom or who is connected to whom. And then there are three possible things you can learn with such graph neural networks. One would be global graph, a global graph property that could be, for instance, the toxicity of the molecule. It would just be toxic or not toxic. Or it could be the phase of a many-body system. You enter a many-body quantum Hamiltonian here and you just want to learn whether this is solid, fluid, or whatever. So that would be a global property of the whole thing like a phase or toxicity. Another way uh, to, to, to use graph neural networks is in node level tasks. So every graph connect, uh, consists of nodes and edges. And in node level tasks, you want to predict the nodes. So for instance, the spin values in the spin lattice. And then in the node, the spin value would be represented or embedded. And uh, the last uh, way to use them are edge level tasks. And then uh, you would want to predict the edges. And that could be the links in a knowledge graph or the coupling in, in a Hamiltonian lattice, for instance. So in general, graph neural networks are optimizable transformations on all these attributes, the globals, the nodes, and the edges, preserving the graph symmetry. So in every layer, you have this graph symmetry, and typically, you do not change the connectivity in the layers. You could do that, but that, that's typically not done. And now I want to say, tell you one more slide about how these graph neural networks work. This is actually new architecture, it's no, no, not older than, than 10 years. Uh, the main idea here is pairwise message passing um, between the neighboring nodes or edges. So let's look at this simple graph here. In this simple graph, we just have five nodes, x0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And uh, everybody is connected to x0, but no other connections. So that would be our simple graph here. So we have a, a node set and an edge set. And how now do we update? Uh, how does the learning algorithm work? We would look for every node at its neighborhood. So let's look at node x0. Who is connected to 0? Well, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we have to look at this whole neighborhood of all four others. And then we would take uh, for, to compute the next internal hidden uh, state or node representation of x0, we do what? We take um, the representation at the given time step, then we take the neighbor and the edge to its neighbor and put it in a message function. So there is a message, so to say, from x2 to x0 that takes its values and how strong the edge is. There's another message from x3, from x4, and x1. These messages are aggregated up with this operator here. And then together with the node value itself, then there is another function, the update function, that then computes the next node representation, AGO. And now, again, this update function phi and message function psi are neural nets that need to be trained. And the advantages of such graph neural networks are that many problems in physics, chemistry, or combinatorial optimization, like traveling salesmen and so on, have a natural graph structure. So GNNs are very often a natural approach for such problems. And they allow to adaptively learn the importance of each neighbor. So there is a very close connection maybe to the real world problem at hand. The disadvantages compared to other approaches are that they are computationally quite expensive. Typically, they can only be implemented in a shallow way, like three, four, five layers. So that limits the performance on large data sets somehow. And GNNs are fundamentally limited uh, due to some uh, graph theoretical theorems. In particular, they can't be more expressive than the so-called Weisfeiler-Lehmann graph. Um, isomorphism test, yeah, but there is a way out. People have uh, and are developing so-called uh, topological nets that allow higher expressivity. 
but again, uh, no, no free lunch, some advantages, some disadvantages. Yeah, with this, I am done with the introduction to this talk, and now we will come, ah, sorry, I forgot, of course, the last one I just want to mention now, everybody knows this now, transformers, uh, I think they have been put forward in 2017 or so, but they have completely uh, revolutionized uh, the, the field in the last year or two, and now it's almost every day in the news something about uh, large language models, uh, chat GPT, and so on. So this is yet another architecture that is closely related to recurrent neural nets with the difference that you don't have a sequential input one by one, but you have a massive input all at once, and uh, the self-attention mechanism is somehow dealing with this massive data set at once. It can learn how to weigh uh, the input according to already learned measures of relevance. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, to close this introduction, there are many more architectures that I have not uh, shown today, of course, and you can pick your, your favorite network uh, from a big list uh, of options. Uh, there are, there are ma many other architectures, but the one I have just shown in the last 15 minutes certainly make up the bulk of, 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 the, um, of the workforce, so to say. Okay, that brings me to the first uh, project I want to talk about. It's called Quantum Optical Experiments Modeled by Long Short Term Memory by LSTM. And here we were motivated by the question, can neural networks design quantum optical experiments? This was our main motivation. Um, so the physical scenario we were dealing with was we are interested in three photon states with orbital angular momentum. So actually experimentally it's a four photon state, but one is used as a trigger to know that the other three photons are there. And orbital angular momentum, as probably most of you know, is a degree of freedom of a photon that uh, is measured in multiples of h bar, and in principle it can take any integer value. So it's not a qubit like polarization, but the orbital angular momentum is a qdit, uh, where d is in principle arbitrary large and experimentally d equal 300 or more has been reached. And the aim is to find interesting high dimensional entanglement. So every experimental setup consists of a sequence of beam splitters, wave plates, holograms, and so on. And given a setup, if I give you a sequence of this, um, of this experimental uh, building blocks, then it's very easy to compute uh, the final quantum state. You can put that in the computer and clearly uh, do the unitaries, uh, make your matrix vector multiplications or whatever, and you have your final quantum state. The reverse task is extremely hard. If I give you a high dimensional entangled quantum state and I ask you, how do you build that? This is close to impossible. This is extremely hard. And um, what um, Mario Gren has done for a couple of years already, he implemented a random search. Uh, the, the algorithm was called Melvin, and it just tried out random setups, looked at the final state, and classified its interest. So how is it, is it, a, is it a maximal entangled state or not? Uh, what is its Schmidt rank and so on? And this is very costly. It costs about one second per simulation. So it is straightforward, it is easy, but it takes time. And our goal was to improve this through machine learning because inference times in a trained neural net are very fast, milliseconds or less. So uh, our uh, quantity of interest was the Schmidt rank vector. It represents the dimensionality of the states of photons. So let's look at this example state here. It's zero, zero, zero. So three photons, zero, 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 one, zero, one, two, one, zero, three, one, one. This is a maximally entangled state. And its Schmidt rank vector is four, two, two, because Alice's photon really uses up the four dimensional space, zero, one, two, three, that's four dimension. Bob's photon only lives in zero and one, and Charlie's photon also uses up only zero and one. So that we call a four, two, two state. And our goal was to find maximally entangled states with high Schmidt rank vectors, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. And we had some millions of examples. Um, and each sample consisted of the experimental setup as the input. So this is a sequence of these components, wave plates, um, holograms, and so on. And in the end, it had a target value, uh, a supervisory signal, a flag, which said positive or negative, indicating whether or not it's maximally entangled. And a three-tuple, a vector, uh, that says the Schmidt rank, NMK. 
and we had, yeah, like, like millions of examples, and the leading Schmidt rank N was from 0 to 12. But you see in the higher samples, you don't find maximally, states, maximally entangled states so easily anymore. Yeah, and um, we used, uh, we clustered the data by the leading shrimp rank and did some cluster cross-validation on, on the fold zero to eight. Cluster cross-validation means you train a network on the folds with meeting leading rank, Schmidt rank zero to seven, and then you test it on eight. Then you train it on zero to six and eight and test it on seven. Then you train it on zero to five, but not six, and seven and eight, and test it on six. So you always leave one out and train on the others. This gives you very good generalization uh, characteristics. And moreover, to not only have generalization, but really out of distribution capabilities, we did not at all um, test, uh, sorry, train on larger equal than Schmitting, leading Schmidt rank nine. So we use that as an extrapolation set, or so-called out of distribution set. Yeah, and as an architecture, we took uh, an LSTM. So X now would be the sequence of yeah, wave plate, beam splitter, hologram, and so on. Until, and these are variable sequence lengths. Some sequence have 10 elements, some have 20. And the Y hat would be the, the output signal. Uh, it would say whether or not it's maximally entangled and the three tuple of the Schmidt rank vector. And uh, setups are then proposed after training. Setups are proposed randomly, and we characterize a setup as interesting when it's classified as being maximally entangled, and when its Schmidt rank vector is in some closeness to uncharted territory. So we were interested in finding new states, and um, these are then checked uh, by the simulation on what they really are. And here I show some results. Um, there's some trade-off between a rediscovery ratio of what we knew already and the precision. But in general, the model performed very well on a wide set of parameters. So true negative and true positive rates um, and precision were all uh, very well, uh, especially when allowing some distance to uncharted territory. And uh, this is again, uh, this is the cluster cross-validation. So it shows that the two negative rates are uh, high for all validation faults and in general all metrics are very good also for the extrapolation set. So this is quite remarkable that this LSTM performs very well on the data in a part of, of the, so to say, the Hilbert space which is, it has never seen in training. So we demonstrated that the LSTM can learn to predict the characteristics of such high dimensional quantum states uh, without any explicit knowledge about quantum physics. And this in principle can be used as a generative model where you can, yeah? The training set uh, we was, was calculated by, by Melvin over many months. Uh, uh, and it was just randomly selected uh, uh, sequences and then computing the target values. This was the training set. Yeah, 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 yeah. Training set is very important and this is a huge amount of computational power in the training set. But once you have it, then you can have very fast inference. Yeah, and in this, and, and you can build a generative model out of the discriminative model where I would give you uh, a certain number of elements and then the LSTM would predict the next best element. Like, then you should put a hologram or a wave plate or whatever. Okay, this closes the, the, the first uh, application. Now to the second one. Um, this is uh, ResNets for the prediction of planetary collision outcomes. This was a work mainly pushed forward by Philip Winter, who had an astrophysics background um, and then switched to machine learning. So the motivation here is um, we want to have a fast and accurate treatment of collisions in n-body planet formation. And this is a very challenging task because um, there is a very fast way to do that. It's called perfect inelastic merging, but it is also very inaccurate. Yeah? Yeah? Uh-huh. 
Yeah. Okay, uh, so I understood the question, how does this compare to genetic algorithms? And I have to simply admit, I do not know. We have not tested it. To my general knowledge, deep learning outperforms genetic algorithms in tasks which require large data sets usually. But we have not looked at it or tried it. I'm sorry, I can't, can't comment more than that. Um, Okay, so there is this fast but inaccurate way to do it, and then there is, again, a, a very accurate but slow way to do it, and that's called smooth particle hydrodynamics, SPH, and a very expensive way to, to make these simulations. And our goal was to tackle the problem with um, machine learning, in particular ResNets, and achieve a good trade-off. So you invest once, some time, in SPH simulations, and then on that data set, you have a good network that can, that can make good predictions than fast for new data. Yeah, and here you see some, some collision here where both uh, planets, so to say, survive. And, and here they actually merge. Um, the, the, the blue and the red one, they collide and merge. So there's this hit and run scenarios and mergers. And this uh, takes a couple of hours, such planetary collisions. So previously in the astrophysical community, such things were tried already, but previous data sets did not uh, take into account the water of planets, which actually is quite important for good simulations, and they did not take into account initial rotations of the two um, planetary systems. And we did all this. We created a data set of about 10,000 SPH uh, simulations. And we did consider water fractions and rotations of the target and the projectile. We randomly sampled over a wide variety of initial conditions. So what is the initial rotation? What is the impact angle? What is the impact velocity? What is the mass ratio? Something between 5 and 100% from the smaller to the larger target. The, the total masses are so between Ceres and Earth. Um, and we also had some algorithms that identified the fragments. So after these collisions, uh, all hell breaks loose, but sometimes fragment, small fragments uh, can be identified, and sometimes they are not even uh, touching each other, but only gravitationally bound. And, but we also were able to um, have that um, treated uh, correctly. Um, in general, there are three major outcome regimes. So there can be erosion, that uh, um, the target loses mass, so the, the, the projectile hits the target and takes away some mass. Uh, this is how probably our moon was, was created, I guess. And then there's accre accretion, uh, that means that the target gains mass from the projectile, and um, in hit and run there are two two remnants, and it depends on the impact velocity, the impact angle, and the mass ratios on where you are. And previous approaches in this community just took classical machine learning algorithms like uh, support vector machines, SVMs, uh, KNN is uh, K nearest neighbors, RF is random forests. Um, some feed-forward neural networks have been tried, and in regression, in regression gradient boosting has been, yes? Yeah, angular momentum, the rotation is important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, here, yeah, there, there, it's hard to draw three, four, five dimensional graphs. Here it's only the impact velocity and the impact angle over the masses. Yeah. Um, and our approach was, was a genuine deep learning approach. So we uh, built a residual net architecture with an autoregressive model that ticked through time steps. So we had multiple iterative steps. Uh, so we have an inductive bias due to the physics here, and we have a weight-tight um, residual net with actually three shared uh, feedforward networks, and we do these adaptive updates, which effectively is something like an Euler integration. So this is one of few examples, actually, where um, we have a very physics-inspired way how the network works, and therefore also an interpretability of the result, which is quite nice. So uh, let me quickly report here on the, on the results. So this ResNet really significantly outperformed uh, feed-forward next or all other classical approaches like support vector machines and so on on, on most of the tasks, including an out-of-distribution set. This is always ex particularly interesting to, to the researchers, how well does a trained neural net generalize to data that are out-of-distribution so that it really has never seen. 
Um, our ResNets uh, are slightly less parameter efficient. That means they need more parameters than the compared FNN, but they are uh, significantly more data efficient. So we can train them much better on, 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 on the data on sm with a small amount of data. Yeah, and this advantage is due to the algorithmic bias. It's just the network itself that has an architecture that is close to the problem at hand. And the intermediate states of the ResNets, they are interpretable because they store the physical values themselves. This is not at all typically the case in a neural network. It, it does whatever it wants and in the end uh, con converges to some output, but whatever is in between typically is a black box. And here this is, this is, is not the case. Okay, that brings me to the last part of the talk. The, the last application is we want to use um, classical shadow measurements to learn ground state properties of uh, quantum Hamiltonians. So um, predicting ground state properties of, of large scale quantum systems is uh, very interesting from a uh, fundamental research perspective, but also very important for uh, developing quantum technologies. And as you all know here, of course, the exact description requires exponentially many measurements uh, which would be a full tomography. So this is a, a big overarching problem. Uh, but of course, there are some solutions or ways to tackle this. And one is the so-called classical shadows that have been developed in the last five years ago. So by Aronson and then Huang Kung Preskill. Preskill won the Bell Prize half now for the classical shadows, I think. Um, so these classical shadows are a way to randomize uh, the, the measurements and then to, uh, to only, with the only logarithmically number of, of uh, so logarithmically in the number of qubits, with only a logarithmic uh, number of measurements uh, to have an approximation to the density matrix which allows to predict certain properties, like for instance, um, uh, two-point correlations. Obtaining data is still expensive, so we were interested and motivated by the, by the question, can we have a sample efficient uh, machine learning model? And, and uh, for some tasks, uh, it is proven that there should be a machine learning superiority, so to predict, for instance, these correlations of lattice Hamiltonians. So our goal was to leverage the graph structure of these Hamiltonians. We were now really motivated by taking the physical situation at hand and using graph neural networks. And we uh, wanted to show that these GNNs, these graph neural networks, exhibit um, better sample efficiency so that they need less data to presented to them to already make good predictions. Our um, problem Hamiltonian at hand was the 2D antiferromagnetic the antiferromagnetic random Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So random means the coupling JIJs are randomly chosen between zero and two. So they are all positive. So this is antiferromagnetic and it's Heisenberg because it's really X, Y, and Z. In principle, this has uh, couplings uh, uh, between all uh, spins, but uh, in the end we took nearest neighbors only. Yeah, and the ML task here is uh, by observing that the JIJs are an implicit representation of the ground state, implicit in the sense that the JIJ make up the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian determines the ground state. And based on the couplings JIJ, they are really given to us. This is, so to say, our input to the graph neural net. We want to predict expectation values of the ground state two-point correlators. So not of the ground state itself, not even about the, of the ground state energy, only about the two-point correlators. So uh, trace C rho, where C is this xx plus yy plus zz over three. Yeah, and, yeah? Yeah, 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 you're right. You're right, the structure of the Hamiltonians is so to say given and, and, and then the JHAs tell you the, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're very right, if I only give you chase, and don't tell you whether it was a Heisenberg or, 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 or Easing Hamiltonian or whatever, then you know nothing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, so uh, on the left here, we see um, the illustration of such a 2D Heisenberg Hamiltonian with 20 spins and only nearest neighbor couplings now. This is quite important for the next slide. So we now uh, restrict ourselves to nearest neighbors only and uh, choose some random couplings and the strength are written here as numbers and are illustrated by the width of these gray bars. 
And of course, for, su for such a Hamiltonian, you can uh, uh, compute the so-called ground truth. This is machine learning language, so the, the actual values of the two-point correlators are computed from DMRG for, for one Hamiltonian here. And also, then you can think of what is the average correlation over all possible pairs, so zero with one, zero with two, zero with three, one with six, one with seven, so on, so all pair combinations that have only distance one, well, uh, uh, sorry, that have distance zero, well, that's the uh, spin with itself, it's of course perfectly correlated. Whenever you look at next neighbor correlations, you get a negative value because it's an antiferromagnetic system, and for d equal two, they are then positively correlated and so on. So you can look at these average correlations over distance d, and this is what we will later also look at. Yeah, we compare uh, the following methods, uh, but actually I'm only interested now in, in showing you the difference between the first two. Uh, one is a fully connected uh, graph neural network where the prediction of the correlation is directly calculated from the edge embedding. Okay, so we have a graph that has these 20 nodes and every node, so to say, corresponds to a spin of the real system. But now, um, in, in reality, only next neighbor spins are coupled. But in the graph, we want to predict also a correlation between spin five and 10. So there's a distance of five maybe. And so we need to have an edge in the graph where in the edge we can learn the correlation. So the, the graph doesn't look at all like, like the system because in the graph everybody is connected with everybody and we have an edge learning task. You might think that this is not ideal and indeed it is not ideal. <laughs> but uh, so this requires edges between all the nodes. In the edge you learn a hidden vector and that is fed into a feedforward network to obtain the correlation. Then we took the very physically motivated uh, so-called pairwise GNN, where the edges only are present for the nearest neighbors. So now our graph neural network looks exactly like the spin net. It looks exactly like that. Five by four and only the nearest neighbors are coupled. But now how do we get correlations? How do I get the correlation from node five to 10 if this is not connected in the graph? And the answer is in the, in this, in the, in, in the following way. You uh, compute the correlation prediction based on the inner product of this node embedding. So in every node, there's a big embedding space, there's a huge spin, so larger than the real physical spin, and then the, inner, and then the spins are learned such that the inner products lead to the um, uh, correlation, to the two-point correlation. And we compare this to an MLP, which has done before already, and to a neural tangent kernel, which was also had done before already. So our work was the first two. And our quality measure is the mean squared error uh, on the test set. So it's the square difference between the prediction C hat, so this is the prediction of the correlation value between spins i and j, and the ground truth, the true value is Cij. And in the test set, of course, you, you know all these values. And this is how you learn. Yeah, and this is the uh, result here. So on the left, we can see the error, so this mean squared error on the test set versus the number of training Hamiltonians, 10 to 300. And we can clearly see here that this pairwise GNN, the uh, graph neural network that respects the physical graph structure is uh, the best. And similarly, um, we can look at the error versus the system size. So how many, um, we now take 80 um, Hamiltonian, uh, we, we take uh, 80 different Hamiltonians. Um, and now we vary the system size, uh, four by five, five by five, six by five, and seven by five, so up to 35 qubits. And also there we see that the error is best. Ah, and then we cal calculate the average correlation for next neighbors. And again, the pairwise GNN is winning, and then we do it for D equal five, so for the distance uh, five steps to the next, 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 next neighbor, so to say. So the conclusion here is that pairwise graph neural networks outperform all other methods, um, and it has the same graph structure as the Hamiltonian. So this inductive bias seems to have a good effect here. Yes? Yeah, um, in the pairwise GNN, we learn, we learn the nodes. In, in every spin, there would be uh, in an embedding space with a, with a big vector, and to compute the correlation between two nodes, 
doesn't matter whether they are neighboring or not neighboring. We take the scalar, we take the scalar product plus some processing of that. Yeah? It's not directly, this, but almost, yeah. Yeah, and the outlook is here to use GNNG in larger experimental setups. Um, if I have one minute left, I want to show you uh, a follow-up work, which was done by the same consortium, so, but I was in parental leave, so now I'm talking about uh, work not done by me, but direct follow-up work on what I just talked about. And this is basically theoretical work, but also partially experimentally. So it was already previously demonstrated that um, learnability of observables can be done uh, when the number of data scales polynomially in relation to the system size n. This is a, 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 res a result for PAC learning from a couple of years ago. And this work now improved this bound to a logarithmic scaling by introducing a locality inductive bias. So the number of training data to uh, learn uh, properties should scale only logarithmically in the number of um, qubits, which is extremely powerful. And the trick here is that the feature vector is formed not for one node itself, but from a locality region. So in this hexagonal lattice, for instance, it would be always a full plaquette that we would write into a, a, an embedding vector. And yeah, just uh, very briefly, it turns really out that this new model uh, requires less shadow measurements, so less measurements of these classical shadows I have talked earlier. It has a better sample complexity and better system size scaling. So indeed, the theoretical results somehow now merge with the experimental endeavors. Uh, and the holy grail, of course, would be to have only a logarithmic number of measurements and samples from some maybe classical shadow techniques and then have good predictions for certain properties, for instance, two-point correlators of physical systems. Yeah, and that, uh, uh, in time, brings me to the conclusion of this talk. So I have uh, tried in the first 10 or 15 minutes to show you that deep learning is an extremely powerful technique and that there exist many different neural network architectures. Specific problems require specific architectures. There is no one size fits all solution in deep learning. Um, and very often, depending of course on your problem at hand, uh, but especially in deep learning, you do need good and large data sets and also large uh, computational power. Otherwise, classical machine learning techniques like support vector machines, gradient boosting, and random forest, and so on, might uh, still do much better. So if you have only small or medium-sized data sets, deep learning might not be the way to go forward. Um, but deep learning can be applied in a plethora of fields and subfields of physics and science in general, um, namely whenever you have enough data to train your models. And the drawback is that typically, I showed you this one exception in our astrophysics uh, uh, project, but, but typically you get a black box solution without interpretability. That is a drawback we have to live with somehow. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much for this very nice talk. Um, we already have a, had a lot of questions, but uh, there are more, so maybe run around with the mic. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I have two quick questions. So the first one is, uh, I mean, the result that you had with uh, graph neural network where you basically on your Eisenberg uh, disorder, Hamiltonian, where you had this locality between the interactions. So did, did you try to see if you have a fully connected graph neural network and you have a, an all to all interaction, are the results better or the previous one? You're referring to here the, the local regions of parameters? No, the, the previous, previous slides. Okay, you're referring, so here the, the pairwise GNN is outperforming the fully connected GNN. So if we, have, if we have a graph where everybody is connected with everybody such that on the edges we can try to learn the correlations, this is uh, uh, poorer than only the, the pairwise GNN where we respect the physical coupling structure. What happens if you have 
fully connected Hamiltonian, not pairwise. Ah, if, on a fully connected ah, graph. Okay, sorry, it. sorry, now I got the question. What if the Hamiltonian is fully connected? We have not tried that, if I remember correctly. Uh, I reckon if the Hamiltonian is fully connected, then also the fully connected graph neural network will probably, then I guess the pairwise uh, connected graph will, will perform poorer as it will not respect the structure anymore. We have not done it, but that would be my guess. For the fully connected Hamiltonian, I expect the fully connected graph network to do better. I see, so you need some knowledge of the Hamiltonian in, in, the, mm -hmm. in your answer, okay. So my second question is um, for the other slides where you have this embedding of the plaquet, mm -hmm. and you see this logarithmic dependence on the, on the yeah, on the system size. So what happens if you, it seems to me that your system has translational invariance. Suppose that you have like disorder between the, yeah. the nodes. Do you think that you still have this very nice logarithmic scaling? Um, that's also a good question that has not been looked at yet. Um, I guess that even then uh, some advantages should remain because this really is about the efficiency of the embedding space in machine learning. So I, I don't know, this is a good question. We, it has not been looked at yet, but my guess would be that even without the translational symmetry, stuff would, ge would get a bit messier in the implementation, but I believe that the advantage should remain because I feel that this is part of the embedding in the machine learning protocol. One more question about um, um, the correlations in the, uh, in the Heisenberg model. Um, so as, if I understood correctly, you're basically learning um, the pairwise co correlations yes. here. So is it possible to use your setup to uh, learn pairwise cor correlations, but then try to predict maybe three body or higher body correlations? Yeah, uh, uh, good question. Um, well, the thing is that, that uh, for, the, for the pairwise uh, correlations, we know that they behave well for data that has um, been acquired from the classical shadows. But it is known that the higher the correlations are, the less good the classical shadow techniques is in predicting them. So it's, it's our first step in the data generation where we have this big information loss already that cannot be saved anymore by the later machine learning, of course. But uh, yeah, these uh, hi higher order correlations are, uh, are, so to say, an open research question. Maybe you can use this to denoise the shadow in some sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, one more question I would have, um, which is, do you have any sort of estimate um, how resilient your predictions are for the setup if you would have small terms in the Hamiltonian that you did not know there would be? Oh, you mean if in the Hamiltonian itself there is some 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 other term, like a small magne magnetic field in the lab? Uh -huh, or uh -huh. No, no, we have not made any attempts in in that direction or any studies. Also, a very good question. Uh, can't right. say anything to that. Okay, well, okay. let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you.